Hello, Breach Burke, and here we are for our Monday Catonia podcast live stream. Um, this is, nobody's joined me quite yet, so I'll just keep talking on this. Um, Instagram, uh, this, this live stream that I post here, just for people who tune into this uh, afterwards, I always download this after I've recorded it. I mean, I, it, is, it is available on my Instagram profile, but it will also be available on YouTube tomorrow. I will download it, uh, the, the full live stream. So if you don't get the whole live, then um, yeah, you can check it out a little bit later. Um, but today is uh, it's a rather interesting day. Today, Mercury retrograde has just started for those of you who actually follow astrology. And sort of true to form, um, in spite of, you know, there's always kind of corrective measures that one can take, supposedly in astrology. Um, but I've already had, what was it? I had my toilet running for like 20 minutes before and I was like, what's going on? And apparently something's come loose and, and anyway, I had to fix that. And then something I've been waiting for, a uh, package I've been waiting for that I've been tracking has somehow managed to go from Jersey City to Kearney to Flemington to my local post office and it's been sent back to Flemington and the town next door three or four times and I don't know what's going on. Um, and it was something I really wanted to have by today, but anyway, uh, yeah, so my point being is that um, it seems, you know, it, it actually technically Mercury Retrograde doesn't start till 6.14 p.m. Eastern time. So it's getting a head, running head start. So uh, yeah, so it should be interesting. Hopefully we get no interruptions with this live stream. Speaking of odd live stream things, I've, I've had people tell me uh, on these live streams that I've had at least a couple people tell me that there's been weird times where my voice has either slowed, up, uh, slowed down, sped up, or somehow in another way, uh, I don't know, it just seems like it's weird or altered, and I don't know, maybe it's a glitch on their part, but I'm just curious to know if that happens for anybody else. When I play it back, uh, when I've when I've rewatched these, um, I haven't noticed it. So, uh, but I've heard about it on at least three different ones. So, if it's anything you happen to notice, do drop me a comment afterwards and say, uh, "Yeah, you sounded really weird here." So, anyway, I'm just curious about that. That's just another interesting thing that had come up. Um, in terms of Catonia, just like I always give a quick update on that in the very beginning of these, uh, I do have now two. In addition to Maven Morgan timelines being available. As ebooks, I now have two more titles uh, in the hopper, one for May 1st, one for June 1st, uh, called Project Lethe and Regenerator, two more novels of mine. And then there's going to be a third one I'll be adding for July. I haven't done that yet. Um, and then they'll probably, oh, I'll probably have novels coming out every month on my imprint through September, because I have a lot of things that I managed to finish, and now I'm trying to get those finished, get the artwork done, and deal with Ingram's ridiculous... Um, <clears throat> Uh, cover template process uh, and they're, they're very bland colors that they use and the way in which they, they want things in a certain format, a certain press ready format, but then when you export it in press ready format, they say, no, it's not in press ready format. And it is. And then the only other thing that seems to guarantee it's in the format that they like changes the size of the whole thing. So anyway, I, I yeah, I've been struggling with that kind of ridiculous stuff over the last few days. Um, and, uh, you know, just other stuff. But th that's the main thing. Oh, th yeah, really important thing. If you notice my t-shirt today, this is the podcast logo. Um, and we have another logo too. The one that I use for these live streams with the woman sort of sitting contemplating a crow. Both of these were designed by uh, J.R. Malpair. And I have, uh, I, these are now in my, I, I had had them at, on a cafe press store, which I don't think anybody ever visited. Maybe one or two people visited it in the last five years. And uh, I have another channel that I follow that had makes uh, that had uses spring.com for their products. And so I had decided to, and I had I'd actually ordered something for this other channel that I watch, and the products were really nice. I mean, they were good quality. I, they're, they were good quality, they were comfortable. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna switch my Catonia products over to that. So right now I think it's just mainly t-shirts and mugs and stuff like that, but, uh, but there is some merch over there. And uh, I've now added it in Instagram. It's actually on my profile. I have a merch link there. I'm going to be adding it to my website and I will share it on Patreon as well and probably Facebook, a couple different places. So uh, anybody who is interested in the Catonia merch, because, you know, my friend is a really extremely talented artist and I just love the stuff that he had created for me. Um, so, uh, so that stuff will be available there uh, now as well. So I'm just sort of spreading the word. I'll probably have a post about it later too. Okay, 
that's all the business out of the way. So um, today's podcast that came out was on fate and on the fates. And this this particular one um, was, well, okay, it was an interesting way that that started because I, I have a master list of podcasts and I knew I was doing the whole um, feminine Christian mystics at the beginning of 2024. Now I've gone through all the ones that I plan to do so far. I mean, I haven't, you know, forget it, unless I get requests for others, but uh, I hadn't looked back at the master list that I had created in a while. And oftentimes I will do the master list in order, but there's really no reason to do that. I just say, oh, this one seems appropriate right now. I'll do this one. <clears throat> so there's been a number of things kind of going on in my own life and in my own work and my own practice. And I might have referenced these uh, elsewhere related to particularly the subject of love and death and the connection between the two. And as part of this discussion, there was a discussion of fate. Now I had gotten an email from somebody who had emailed me on the Ketonia.net and had said, you know, are you, you know, I was asking me questions about fate and the fates. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, the fates are always portrayed as three females. This would be a great podcast topic. And sure enough, when I looked at my list, apparently I must've been thinking that last year because <clears throat> I have a podcast on, I listed the Norns, which is the Nordic uh, trio of fate, go <clears throat> fate goddesses, excuse me. And um, so I said, oh, okay, well, if I'm gonna do the Norns, I should probably just do a gem more general one on fate, particularly the Mora or the Morai, which are the Greek versions of the fates. Those are the ones that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and the Norns, of course, are another one. They're, they're very, they're, they, as I, I, I talk a lot about this on the podcast, and I don't want to use this live stream to reiterate everything I've said on the podcast, because that, you can, you can listen to that. Um, it came out pretty well, but the more I was going through the, the podcast, I was also talking about the Charis, too, which are sort of the anti-fates. They're, they're the spirits of doom and of violent death. So I, I incorporated those into, into the discussion as well. And uh, oh, somebody commented on YouTube about that too, because I posted it this morning and someone said, surely you're going to bring up the role of Uranus or Uranus in, in this. And my only response to that is Uranus doesn't have any role. I mean, Uranus is involved in the, is a kind of the celestial creator, but uh, there's no connection. Like Uranus is not the father of the fates. I don't know. I, I, I sort of looked it up. I thought, did I miss something there? So when I started to look it up, I was like, no, there, I, I saw something about some kind of fanfic. So I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody's reading some, something that, um, kind of like people who read Percy Jackson and stuff like, you know, um, the novels and stuff. I don't know if, if there's a, if, if people are thinking that there's a connection that there isn't, uh, but the fates, <clears throat> the fates are either considered to be the chil uh, the child of, um, sorry, the children of Nyx, the goddess of night by herself, or by Zeus and Themis, okay, the, the, uh, who are bringing the divine order. Um, Themis is the goddess of, uh, tightness of order, and so that, that, that definitely establishes them in having a role connected to setting boundaries, okay, just like the Arrhenius of the Furies, that's, uh, they are, they are there to, uh, to set, set the kind of boundaries, the orderly boundaries of the universe, and, and maybe to, and then maybe to a more uh, micro degree to our individual lives. So I, I get into a whole philosophical discussion about, you know, free will versus determinism, right? That's the that's the old philosophical question that people have, is whether or not how much how free are you, uh, how much and, and how can you use your reason to avoid fate. Um, those of us who do things like readings or look at astrology charts or, or things like that, a, a lot of times it, it, there's a there's a predictive element to it. Um, Alan Watts had once said that that the uh, the systems of knowledge that we have, the the most successful ones, are systems that deal with uh, prediction, and and how good they are at prediction. So, for example, if you he I think he might have used this example. If you have uh, if you're talking about whether or not say a hurricane's gonna come in or a bad weather event. Um, the, you, could, you could have oracles and omens that you could interpret. Actually, if you do know how to read signs and the weather and so forth, you might get an idea. But with science, you have you know, scientific instruments that can 
see things several days out and can tell you the exact time that things get there and so forth. So, I mean, in terms of natural phenomenon and, and that kind of things, science has a really, really good predictive power, uh, which is completely based on causality. It's based on, um, you know, we, we can show in a repeatable experiment that this happens over and over again this way, and thus we can establish that this is the way that this happens. Um, and that's fine for a lot of natural phenomenon in the natural world, but it doesn't necessarily work for other kinds of things, especially when we come to the very, um, the, the wonderful subject of death. Okay? And, uh, and death, of course, is a subject I inevitably deal with a lot because, uh, first of all, my side gig, my mentoring gig, is more in helping people go through transitions, whether they are physical deaths or otherwise. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that too. Um, the, the connection between death and marriage, actually, that's, that's something that, that I was, again, reading about in connection with this podcast, that I was like, ooh, this is really interesting. Um, it does make sense when you think about it, but I will, I'll talk about that. Um, but I have this, so yeah, so, so death ends up being in focus a lot because my focus is the underworld, right? I, I deal, my, my book, uh, Death and the Maiden, is, is an academic work that looks at the um, archaic versions or ideas about the underworld, at least in Near Eastern culture. Um, I don't, I don't get as heavily into Egypt as I probably should, but I feel like Egypt probably deserves its own book. It, it's, it, it, it really is foundational to a lot of the beliefs we have about life after death, and certainly Greek and Roman belief as it shifts and changes starts taking on characteristics of Egyptian belief and also takes on characteristics of uh, Zoroastrian belief in particular, uh, things that come out of Persia. And you know the linguists will argue about how much that also comes from India, but that's that, that's a that's a completely separate rabbit hole. Um, nonetheless, you have this um, <clears throat> you have you know the, the 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 subject of death comes up quite a bit, and when you start getting into humanistic philosophy, which is what you see, we think of Plato mostly. He's not the only guy, uh, but when when you start getting into Greek philosophy, this is when you start having humanistic thinking, because humanistic thinking champions reason and suggests that we as humans, there's a mythology, the Orphic mythology of how we are, we come from the dust of Titans who were destroyed uh, when they tried them, when they killed and ate Dionysus, okay? Dionysus is the original Jesus. I mean, he's, he's in that sense, he's, he's killed and he's eaten and then he's resurrected. Uh, so the whole Eucharistic idea and everything as well. And in fact, I think there were Dionysian rituals that, that um, and probably Mithrian rituals as well, that, that seem to have connected into that idea as well as baptism rituals and so forth. But Dionysus is, you know, he's supposedly killed, eaten, and then when he's resurrected and then Zeus destroys the Titans because Dionysus in this mythology is Zeus's successor. So, um, so they resurrect his, the, the son of God here, the, the successor, and he punishes the Titans by hitting them with a lightning bolt and reducing them all to ashes, and out of those, human beings arise in this cosmology. So it's said that you have the, Plato says this, um, was, it in the, was it in the Republic? I think so, where he talks about the titanic nature, or the wicked nature, that, that humans inherit from the Titans, and then, but then they have the divine spark of Dionysus, right? So, so the, you start to have this idea of human beings as being divine in origin in some uh, fashion. And what the philosophers think, the way, at least the way that they thought about this, was that what made us superior to the rest of creation or made us more godlike was our sense of reason. Okay, this is where Logos gets privileged. This idea that, um, that that words and being able to think and reason and logically analyze make us better than um, other species, which I think as as time has gone on, I think that we might find that to be a bit debatable. I mean, certainly reason, you know, yes, reason is an extraordinarily important tool that we have as human beings, but usually it's at, it's at the expense of other tools that we have. And not paying attention to those other tools, we realize that reason is potentially limited in its application, at least in certain cases. Um, so what does this have to do with fate? Well, there's, there's a lot of mythology around, or at least there's, there's stories, uh, Greek drama and, and other uh, stories about how people try to outwit fate. And I found a very interesting article, in fact, it was in the context of this email that I had received, um, uh, the person's, uh, uh, Radulovich is the last name of the author, 
And the, the Radulovich article, uh, and I actually have it up here. My, my laptop is sitting over here. Now, this is more of a folkloric article that talks about fate from the perspective of types of fates and in, in terms of how people are going to die. Because the, the motif is that the fates that are, that he, this was in talking about Serbian folklore, okay? Um, because I was interested also in the, the Slavic myths and, and, and the Serbian myths. Maybe, maybe that's another conversation Joanna and I can have at some point. Um, but they were, they were talking about um, what, the, what the folkloric motifs, because they always have them in classifications and then subclassifications as to how, um, as to what, what the, the common story is. This is a very structuralist kind of article, um, a structuralist version of myth. And what they mention is that the, the three, there's only three women who are, are represented as fate, three demon women, at least in the, in the Slavic because fate is considered to be very, very cruel, especially when you have uh, children who die very, very young. And in fact, I think there was a mention here of how uh, in Serbian you thought that the fates felt that human mothers really didn't care if their children died in childbirth. So uh, in one sense, they would say, well, if it was a very poor family, then it was a mercy because then that child didn't have to grow up starving and in poverty. Um, but uh, in other versions of that, the, those the that that attitude, of course, is considered to be an evil, and you you could really argue that both ways. But whether that means that the fates are inherently evil or not is is another question. So yeah, so when we talk about fate here, we're talking about it in terms of predestination. So what what can we say about the moment of death? Okay, when when somebody's going to die, um, and the, the uh, in this particular article, they were talking about certain deaths that show up in mythological and folklore motifs, namely death by snake bite, death in a well, or connected to drowning or water, um, and death, and this was interesting, coming from a frog or a turtle. And in those, in that case, it's the idea if someone's told that that's their fate, then they kind of laugh at that. They think, how is some small little animal going to, going to destroy me? But of course, it inevitably happens in these stories. And what's interesting is that it is these three female figures that make that that, that make the life decision basically. Uh, in one of the images that I think I have, might have been the one I actually used on Instagram for the podcast. You actually have this idea of the fates kind of standing, holding almost like it looks like a it almost looks like a map of the cosmos. And the idea is almost the so because nowadays, if we were thinking about the idea of fates being determined at someone's birth you might do their astrological chart, certainly as done in India. I mean, that is still a, a thing that is done as a regular occurrence. And of course, I, I do them for my, my grandnieces and so forth. Um, I have, uh, what you call it? Um, yeah, in fact, I have a new grandniece that is probably going to be born any second. And I spoke to her parents, uh, parents-to-be uh, yesterday, and I said, uh, make sure you, you contact me with the exact time of birth because I need to run her chart as soon as she's born. And so, yeah, so, so but, you, but this is more about fate in terms of death. Now, honestly, I, I don't know, when people do astrology, nobody's looking for death in the chart. I mean, now some charts might tend towards an untimely death, you know, somebody dying younger. Um, I know that the first time I had my Vedic chart done by a professional Vedic astrologer, I think I was like 31 years old, 30, 31, and he had told me that he, he was able to look in what they call, I now know it's what they call the D10 chart, which has to do with your family connections. And he said, uh, oh, uh, your father had pneumonia last month, didn't he? And I was just like, how would you know that? I mean, my father had, first of all, yes, he had, but I mean, it was not something I would ever remark on to anybody. I wouldn't call up my friends and be like, hey, my dad has pneumonia. Like, there was just no reason to mention it to anybody. Um, and he'd never been sick at all in his life. So it was an odd occurrence. Uh, he just assumed it had to do with his smoking. And I remember he quit, uh, he used to smoke pipe and cigars and things for years. And he, he quit after that. But um, he said, oh yeah, he said the pneumonia thing is a karmic thing that's, that's going to be repeating, may even be connected to his death at some point. So that was the first time I heard anybody using a chart for that purpose. He also told me that I had a brother that had died before the age of 30 from a, something, in, a disease in the blood. And of course, my brother did die from, uh, from AIDS back in 1989, and he was only 22. So that, yes, so he had, he had two predictions, and this, this guy had no reason to know any of that about me. I'm, I'm not even sure that's information I shared with the people 
in the group that I was in that hooked me up with the astrologer. You know, I don't even think that they knew that. So, um, so there's a lot that can be told, is the point being, about that in the chart. Uh, they call it the Capricorn or the, Ma the Makara um, aspect of the chart. But um, I've, I've looked at it at times just out of curiosity more than anything, because I just don't think it's a good idea to look for that kind of stuff in the chart. But there's a whole thing about um, the rulers of certain houses, um, your ascendant ruler in the eighth house, and there, they, there's some kind of a, a formula, they call it the Arabic point of death, uh, um, um, it's a point of death or something, but basically there's some kind of a approximation about what, what planetary configuration will be the trigger. And that's never a good thing to look at because that planetary configuration will be in your chart over and over and over again, and it doesn't mean you're going to die. So... Um, Anyway, just that's a little digression into astrology, but I thought that was rather interesting. When I'm thinking about the idea of fate, I think that that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, the way in which we look at what the map or the destiny of somebody is going to be. Now, of course, the problem with that, and anybody who is an astrologer or even a reader will tell you that, uh, you know, this is not, you know, we, we talk about it being fated, but it's, it's not really fated. That's why there are such things as remedies. Oh, okay, you have this unfortunate aspect in your chart. Well, here are the things you can do to try to, you can't get rid of it, but you can mitigate it, right? Um, but in this particular folkloric um, scheme that we're talking about, the, the author notes that there are three fates, three female fates, these figures, that are often in, in these instances viewed as evil because they are bringing about a death, especially if they're bringing about an untimely death, although as we see in the Greek Untimely death tends to be connected to the the charis, the, the the bringers of doom, and they're like sisters of they're agents of of, of fate of the morai, but they're not actually, um, but they're considered to be very bloodthirsty. You know, they 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 ravage, they go around the battlefield, they try to make people die before their time. Okay, and but but, but they it's noted that a lot of times the way in which the, these three female figures, whether they be more idle, whether they be the Norns, even, you'll even see it to a certain degree, even though they're not fates per se, even a, a goddess like Morrigan, who is not uh, a goddess of, I mean, she, she's, a, she's a, a prophetess, that's one of her roles. She does go, go around the battlefield, but she's not like a, like a Valkyrie. She's not somebody who chooses who's going to die. Of course, if somebody ticks her off, she's certainly going to do what she can to hasten their demise. But her role as such has been more about encouraging battle, encouraging people in battle. And certainly if somebody is going to meet their doom in battle, that's when you see her as this washer at the forward figure, washing bloody chariots or bloody clothing or things like that. Like she has this sort of, um, foretelling role and she does have a little bit of a boundary setting role maybe they, she might be a little more they might be a little more in function like the furies rather than the um than the fates per se but um but there is but there is this this kind of fatalistic role and just like the ruselki or the ruselka in uh, russian mythology as well um but there's this there's this interesting association with water and and in this particular mythologies there is a usually a man who is opposing fate. And that I find to be very interesting because it's the idea, so okay, if we talk about, if we go broad here and, and look at categories of masculine and feminine in terms of the feminine being connected to the catonic, connected to eros, connected to what's what's felt, what's intuited, what's, um, what's more, more of the the feeling side of things, or more of, you know, or more connected because of the connection to Earth, therefore connected more to the idea of death. What you have here is the man who comes in and says, "Oh, I'm going to stop this fate." So there's there's the logos that comes in. There's there's the the rational drive that comes in to say, "No, I'm going to outwit fate. I'm going to I'm going to somehow sidestep all of this." And it never really quite works out because even if fates end up um, making some kind of a, a an adjustment or change, somebody's still somebody's still going to get it in the end. Okay, you you're not. There's no way if somebody's destined to die and go to the underworld. Um, there's 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 very few cases in which that can be overturned. In fact, probably almost never. The one of the interesting stories, and I don't talk about this one in the in the podcast, is that of Al Al Alcestis. 
and she is the uh, daughter of King Peleus, and she is married to uh, ends up being married to King uh, Admatus, and, and this is a Greek myth, and of course there's the whole thing about how he has to um, was it chain together a boar, and I, I forget what the other animal is, but in any case he, he manages to do this with the help of Apollo. Okay, we've talked about Apollo too, because at this time Apollo is serving as a shepherd for um, Admatus, Admatus because. Uh, Apollo, Apollo was kicked out of Mount Olympus for doing something. I'm telling you, people who are really into Apollo, one like he is kind of a troublemaker guy. But so Apollo um, helps him do the do the, the this this um, difficult task, and so he wins um, um, Alcestis as his uh, as his wife. And this is talked about in let's see, I think Pseudo Apollodorus talks about this story, and it's also a Euripides play, okay, uh, Alcestis. So. What happens is they have the wedding, and they, you know, the wedding, you know, everything, everything is fine except that they forget to make a sacrifice to Artemis or an appropriate sacrifice. Now, if you listen to my podcast on Artemis and also the one on the Hanging Virgin, these are my older ones that are you know, technically not not as not as good from the, the from an editing point of view, but content wise are are very good. Um, Artemis is. Artemis is sort of the gatekeeper between a girl's childhood and her menarche, when going into womanhood, being able to become fertile, because Artemis is a virgin goddess, okay? And it's it's the rituals that surround Artemis and girls heading into uh, being married or being at marriageable age or having children are all connected. You basically, you have to make sure that Artemis doesn't kill you in the process, okay? So she's 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 um, she's very strong connections uh, to uh, to probably to childbirth. Weirdly enough, even though she's a virgin goddess, and there's the idea that a girl who is, you know, who who is a virgin, the idea of who, her losing her virginity. This is something that, that enrages Artemis. Okay, so she has to be appeased in a certain way, obviously in the marriage rite. Now. This doesn't happen in this case, and so when Admetus goes to the bridal chamber, it's filled, the bed is filled with snakes. <laughs> okay. And it's like, oh, that, that would be, and they, and they interpreted this as a death omen. I'm like, hmm, it, it's unpleasant no matter what. But uh, this, yeah, this was interpreted as a, a very, very bad thing. Because snakes um, certainly are catonic in nature, uh, and like frogs are, and apparently and turtles as well. I mean, they're, they're all animals that have, have a catonic uh, element to them. Wolves as well. And wolf by, death by wolf attack is another one of these motifs that one has when one talks about an early death. And a lot of these are also connected to marriage. So they have to do with a marriage rite that doesn't, um, doesn't go off the way it's supposed to. Um, now, one of the, one of the other... Um, oh, and in the Alcestis one, let me just finish that story. So what happens is... There is a point, he, he is actually, uh, King Admetus is actually doomed to die a younger death. So uh, Apollo helps him again by getting the fates drunk. He goes drinking with the fates and he gets them drunk. And he gets them to agree that if Admetus could get somebody else to die in his place, that he could live. And the fates said, yeah, okay. You know, they, they went along with it. And so when the time comes that his fated time to die, uh, nobody really wants to step up to the plate on this one. So Alcestis does so. She steps up to the plate. And this is supposed to be uh, showing her, her love for her husband that will allow her to extend to the underworld. Although, as this author points out, uh, she's, yeah, but this is also the idea that the, the men don't achieve what they want there without feminine intervention of some kind. So, uh, and, and of course, the interesting thing is she does go to the underworld, but uh, she eventually is rescued by Heracles. Heracles does a lot of rescuing in the underworld, and that's, that's, a, that's a whole other subject about the way he kind of goes down there. And um, you know, he, I think uh, Heracles and, and Dionysus are the only ones who have successfully brought people back from the underworld in that, um, in that mythology. Um, but... So, so yeah, so that's, that story is, is it, it, it talks about, okay, so you have somebody who manages to outwit fate. Of course, he doesn't do it on his own. He does it with a, with a god. And it happens to be Artemis' twin brother who actually helps 
him do this. But you also have the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, and that's that that's one of the more well known ones because uh, Orpheus, of course, is uh, associated with music. He was very beautiful musician with a very beautiful voice. He played you know the lyre. He he was a very very talented musician, and his wedding to Eurydice was very ill omened because and and then within a month she suffered a snake bite. Okay, so there's the snake bite, the the early death by snake bite. And so she goes to the underworld, and once again, he tries to, um, he, he decides he's going to go to the underworld and try to bring her back. And he does this, he does this through music, though. He does it through music, and he almost, almost succeeds. Except that once he's gotten to, out of the caverns of the underworld, he turns around too soon, because they're, they're told, yeah, you can bring her back, but you, you can't turn around and look back. So he was literally almost right there. And as soon as he got to the, the mouth of the cave, he turns around and that's it. She disappears forever. So you really, um, it, it, it's incredibly rare um, and incredibly difficult to get around the dictates of fate. And um, so, okay. So, but but these, it's interesting how many of these fates that connect, are connected to early death are connected to weddings. Okay, and one of the discussions that they have here, which I thought was interesting, I just want to find it here. Um, it's the way, yeah, the way in which there is a connection between marriage and death. Um, and how does he put it? He, she put it here. She says, um, <clears throat> so she talks about the cyclical view of life. Um, all three rites of passage are joined. The moment of one's birth, his or her death is determined to occur on his or her wedding day in this particular motif. Um, and at birth, death is visible, the beginning of life, the end of life is determined. Liminal rites are, are never, nevertheless related and their symbolism is mutually interchangeable. A wedding is presented as the death of the bride. The funeral is organized as a wedding after death. Okay. And, and that has been said the idea that the marriage ceremony is a kind of death ceremony in and of itself. Because if, if you're going to go with the idea that a marriage is going to produce children, which it doesn't necessarily, but if, if you were going to go on that idea, this is the way birth and death are linked. And the way in which one, if one gets married, then to a certain degree, the old life that you have is dead anyway. You are now, um, you are now, you, you now, your identity is now tied up in that of this other person to some degree, okay? Um, and this was an interesting quote. They said, ancient beliefs connected with both the fruitful and to a considerable extent with the erotic nature of death, that was just what I was just talking about, have contributed, judging by all indicators, to the creation and solidification of the female image of death in folklore and literature. In this way, the circle was closed. Marriage and the emergent death were united within one symbol. Marriage became a metonomic replacement for death. And uh, people say that about sex too. They'll say, you know, they talk about orgasm as being kind of a, a mini death, right? Or a little, a little death that one has. Um, so I don't know. So this is, um, so this is interesting in, in how the fates, it sort of end up embodying this very um, catonic um, belief about death, of this, this kind of uh, embodiment of death. And it was also theorized in this article that, um, that the fates were probably, if we're talking about the origins of the fates, which is I think the question that somebody had for me on YouTube with, when I posted today's video, um, they su the suggestion here is that they're probably connected to the ancestor cults to some degree. And, <clears throat> and that makes sense if you think about what I've said about the Norns uh, in, in the podcast. And that is that um, the, the names of the Norns, have, they, what they mean is... Um, they, they, they talk about becoming, they, they talk about, you know, what, what's, 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 what's happening or becoming now, what, I'm trying to think how he said it, it was, it's kind of like, if, if, song, if, if sing is the present tense, then sang is the past tense, is, there's, there's a past inflection to the name of the, the name of fate that is most often associated with the Norns, um, and the fact that the person connected with the past is the one that, who is, seems to be central of the, of the Norns. What is the name? Um, um, I want to say it's Uther, but I, I could be saying that wrong. Um, 
I usually need it, need it in front of me so I can see it. Um, the, uh, I think it's Uther, Varand, Varand, um, Varandi, and then Skuld, I think, are the three names, and I'm sure I'm butchering them right now. But they are... But one has to do with what what's what's already kind of come into play. One has to do with what becoming or happening, and the other one has to do with what ought to happen. Okay, so that's different from saying what will happen. It's what ought to happen. And... But a lot of fate in, in that way of thinking, at least if you look at it linguistically, seems to be predicated on the idea that what you are, that, that fate is about your actions returning to you. Like there's a karma imp implication to it, that you are the sum total of your actions. Okay, so that fate is more about that rather than uh, at your birth somebody making some kind of decision about what you know when and how you're going to die so and and that would definitely in, in the idea of linking fates to the ancestors would make sense because we hear about that and there's a biblical idea of the seventh son of the seventh son and and so on and so forth there's this idea that what's happened before you generationally is going to affect who you are and even scientifically there's <clears throat> there's some um credence to that because it's if you think about it, um, we talk about this a lot, especially when, when certain family things come up. And everybody has their own version of it. I'm not talking about anything particular with my family. But there will be certain things that we have, certain attitudes or certain ways of approaching things. Now, you could say that these are environmental. That, okay, um, I saw my mother handle things this way, so therefore, as an adult, I unconsciously handle things this way. Okay? Um, but the the suggestion has been actually that it's not just environmental in that sense, that it is also genetic, that certain patterns, if there has been uh, patterns of trauma in a family, if there have been patterns of, say, uh, poverty or, or, or lack or something, like somebody who has lived in a family maybe that suffered lack and maybe now has a good deal of money may always somehow still feel that they don't have enough, okay, for example. So a lot of these patterns of our emo both emotional and, and trauma response kind of patterns uh, in terms of how we are going to make decisions and make choices in our lives are probably to a large degree influenced by family and by our predecessors, but not just in the sense of how we saw our family behave, because not everybody does necessarily. Um, there are all kinds of family situations, and they're not... You know, we don't, we're not necessarily exposed to people maybe who had engaged in certain patterns of behavior. But in the end, what ends up happening is that you, um, you, what, you, you end up kind of following a family tradition of something. You may see that certain, if certain traumas happened to one generation, you may find that they happen again in your generation. And it, it really, the only way to stop that is to become aware of the pattern and to be, and well, and, but then again, that brings up the question of how well you can escape your fate. Can you break the pattern? Um, there's people who believe that, yes, that certain people are there to break generational patterns of, of behavior that perhaps are not, not good, good for the family line, shall we say, or that are not, uh, that are not healthy to pass on to another generation. But uh, but that it's interesting because that seems to be what what we're tying fate with here is the idea. In this case, I would think karmic maybe, but maybe also more ancestral. That you know the, the sins of the fathers are are visited upon the children, kind of idea. Um. So uh, so it's uh, it, it's rather um, interesting. Um. So okay. Okay. Yeah. There was another another topic that had come up here and that that connects to marriage and that is the I and I, I this probably relates somewhat to the Alkestis myth that I spoke about but the idea that the um, bride gives half of her lifespan to her bridegroom okay so that when you get married and it's not funny that it's not the other way around um, that it's that the woman gives that that lifespan to to her husband although in theory what that that also means is that Therefore, the husband is supposed to be extra supportive of his wife because his wife is the one who's 
um, allowed his vitality to, to continue on or to increase. And that idea might also be tied to the idea that if, if, if you look at the traditional idea of marriage having and, and children, and certainly in ancient times that would have been the assumption, um, then it could be just the idea that, that your wife in giving you children extends your line. Okay, again, it's ancestral moving forward into the future. But whether or not how those lines continue is, is certainly going to be a matter of what your fate is. And it, it, so, so yeah, it's and it, and it seems like it's even in the naming of some of these um, these fate beings, it, it seems to be connected to that, to this idea of of becoming. What are you becoming based on your ancestral pattern and where you're going? Okay, and and to what degree can you escape from it? Because the when we try to, because that gets into the problem of not knowing. It's the, it goes back to like what, okay, I always go back to Alan Watts, but he had this lecture, you cannot improve yourself. And what he says in that lecture, or what he means when he says that you cannot improve yourself, is that you, we, he says, the re, well, as he put it, the reason you want to be better is the reason that you're not. And what he means by that is that we, if we ourselves uh, have a, are, suffer certain flaws or imperfections or the victim of certain traumas, or maybe if we haven't figured out the way to do something or, or, or whatever, or we have some kind of trait that is a fatal flaw to us or whatever, whatever it is, we all, none, none of us are, are perfect. In fact, uh, the term perfect is, is a weird one because it comes from perficery, which means to finish. So honestly, you're not perfect until you're dead. I mean, whatever whatever happens to you, that's that's when you're finished. Otherwise, nothing's really finished. Um, we may complete certain phases of life or, or others, but then other ones pick up and, and, and we continue on. So yeah, it, it's not, um, we're not ever finished, but recognizing that we don't know all of what it means to perfectly do everything in life. We don't have that kind of predict predictive power, no matter what kind of divinatory skills you have, you don't have that kind of predictive power. You can't, uh, life is very, very uncertain. And this is why fate in and of itself is a, is a terrifying or considered to be an evil to some people because it represents that element of what is unknown. Because even if your fate has been told to you, even if you have an idea that this is where, uh, where your life is headed, um, you really don't know how you're going to get there. And if you think that you are going to sidestep or avoid something, sometimes you just step right into it, like in the Oedipus myth, uh, which I do talk about in the podcast. Um, but it's, yeah, but, but, uh, but there's this idea of, of, of continuity and ancestry and line and how important that seems to be to fate. It's not just about you and what you're doing. It's about you in context. And um, when I teach myth, in fact, I'm teaching it this semester and my students have been, they're, they're now moving into what I call the mythology of the, uh, no, mythology of the individual, because I do a mythology of the collective section and then I do mythology of the individual. And um, so, uh, courses, by the way, which I am willing to offer, you know, I, I, would I would like to be able to offer those to people. And I did in the past, but um, again, I'm not sure how many people were aware, but that is something that um, if people people show an interest in it, that is that is a course that I can teach because it's quite um, it's quite interesting. But in the mythology of the individual, even that we're still looking at um, at groups. We're still look, we're still looking at the individual in a context. Uh, so I have classes on incest in mythology and classes on cannibalism in mythology, which you know I'm sure when somebody first takes my class and looks at the syllabus, they're kind of going what you know. But, but those are important themes because those are two things that taint a family line. Two very big and very obvious taboos that taint a family line. So the idea of, um, because when you have, when you have certain lines, it's, um, I think in particular, we were looking at, for incest, we are looking at the, uh, the Theban saga, the house of Thebes, the house of Cadmia, because that's where the Oedipus myth comes from. Okay, and the idea is that when things like incest come into the family line, um, or if there's an example of cannibalism, which we see in the Mycenaean saga, 
we see it with uh, King Pelops. And Pelops is the one who is, sorry, it's not Pelops, it's uh, Tantalus. Tantalus is the one, Pelops is the son. Tantalus is a, he, he they're, they're usually interesting because these progenitors have a kind of privileged relationship to the gods in some respect. And somehow they decide that they want to test it. So in the Tantalus myth, Weirdly enough, he decides that he's going to kill his son Pelops, cook him, and feed him to the gods just to see if they notice, which is weird. Um, probably there's there's a symbolism that could be dealt. I mean, with most mythology, there's a deeper meaning beyond the the, the story that you see. But and, but the gods realize what he's done, and the only one who takes a bite out of the this cooked Pelops is uh, the goddess Demeter. Uh, she takes a bite out of his shoulder, and uh, as a punishment, because you know having your own son, you know cannibalism is just is just grossly taboo, and to serve um, human flesh to the gods, I mean human sacrifice was not a thing in ancient Greece, and it was actually uh, considered to be something that would curse you or curse your line. So Tantalus gets confined. He's one of the few. I, I've often talked about how punishment after death is not a big thing in Greek myth. He is one of the few who is punished in Tartarus, in the depths of Tartarus, and he is the one who is up to his neck in water, and he's always hungry and thirsty. So if he's thirsty, he tries to bend down to drink the water, but the water just recedes away, and there's a fruit tree hanging above his head, um, and when he reaches for the fruit, it just pulls away from him. And that's where we get the word tantalizing. If something is tantalizing, it means it's just out of reach. You can't, you can't quite get it. And so Tantalus, um, so Pelops ends up being restored to life by the gods because of because uh, of this uh, situation, but then Pelops does stuff he shouldn't do, and and any case, it ends up tainting uh, the line, which is ends up being the house of Atreus. In the Iliad, Atreus is one of the, um, the, the his son is Agamemnon, and Agamemnon is one of the generals in the uh, Trojan War. But Agamemnon, if we remember how he comes to an end, uh, he is. He, sacrifice, he also does a human sacrifice. He sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia to Artemis to get favorable winds to go to Troy. And uh, his wife Clytemnestra is not super jazzed about this. So uh, when he returns from the war, uh, she's there. She has uh, She's now coupled with his half-brother. And then there's the whole thing too, because he has a, um, his, his father Atreus, his brother Thaistes, they were fighting over the kingdom and who was gonna be king. And what ends up happening is, uh, it, it's a whole weird series of events. First, there's this golden ram that gets stolen and given to Thaistes, and that gives him the kingship. And then it, there ends up, then Atreus, it becomes a, it, it, there becomes this thing of, okay, if the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, then Atreus will get the kingship back. And so, of course, Zeus makes the sun set in the west and rise in the east, uh, the other way around, set in the east and rise in the west. Um, so... Atreus gets the kingship back, and to get back at Thaistes, he you know takes his son and kills kills him, cooks him, and feeds him to his own father. And then the father curses him, and then and then there's this whole thing about committing incest, and then that's where Aegisthus comes from. Yeah, it's it's basically about how this whole line just becomes corrupted and corrupted through the actions that people have based on what they may have inherited from their progenitors. Because if their progenitors did bad stuff chances are somebody along the lines also going to do this bad stuff. And of course, that particular saga ends with the Oresteia, which is when, um, after Clytemnestra kills Agamemnon, now their son Orestes is now put in this middle position. Apollo says to him, hey, you have to avenge your father's death. But that means he has to kill his mother. And to kill his mother, now he's going to have the Furies come after him, because matricide is just, it's a, well, a, a, for obvious reasons, a big no-no. Um, so... That's when you have this kind of uh, democratic jury trial where you have a hung jury as to who's going to convict Orestes and who's going to um, acquit him. And because it's, so it's basically Apollo against the Furies, which is interesting. The three women against the male figure. It's, it's interesting. And eventually Athena, who uh, casts the deciding vote in favor of Orestes, um, because... She is also a goddess who is just certainly very rule bound and very much about um, civilization. So she, she's trying to to sort of break the curse of the line, which makes the Furies very, very upset. But then she that's when she starts to say, oh, no, no, you're actually all wonderful. We're going to call you the humanities from now on, the kindly ones. 
and we know how the word kind, term kindly ones is often used um, with respect to either the dead or very um, um, vicious kinds of uh, catonic uh, deities. It's like, oh yeah, it, it's it's the old, um, it's, it's it's the dog that's snarling at you and you say, nice doggy. Uh, it's, yeah, it's that kind of, of thing. You're, you're not gonna, um, you're not, you're not gonna call them maybe what you really think that they are. So, <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, just interesting to kind of reflect on the ancestral aspect of fate here. And I'm losing my voice. <coughs> As I was saying at the beginning of this live stream, Mercury Retrograde is already struck twice today. And um, now I'm, I'm trying to communicate and my voice seems to be, uh, <clears throat> be kind of going out here. But, um, so yeah, so um, what was the other thing I was going to mention? Um, oh yeah, with regard to these, these fates, the other thing that was suggested was that the female fates are often connected to water, which is why you will have, like I was mentioning, the Rusalka, who are spirits of those who have drowned. Uh, when, and also um, the deities that seem to be connected to fate. First of all, they tend to be triple deities. And second of all, they're connected to wells. Which is why, interestingly, the goddess Breach, okay, my my namesake in um, Celtic myth or Saint Bridget, in um, you know later Irish Catholic uh, thinking, is connected to a well, and also was considered to be she had interestingly had the role of being a fate or or because there are three breaches too she's got a triple aspect to her, but she was also very connected with fate but she she was certainly considered to be a more favorable goddess she wasn't viewed as um, necessarily a uh, as an evil deity okay she wasn't wasn't viewed that way but she's very interestingly connected to fate in in the in the irish myth um and that was the idea was that all of this has to do with um you have these 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 triple female figures and you might argue that that triplicity has to do with past present and future but as we said, not necessarily. It's more about the continuing of the ancestral line. What what you what you what happened and what you're becoming, and what you ought to be doing. <laughs> you know what the, the the norms is the idea of, you know what's what's becoming, what what what's gone before, what's becoming, and what ought to be. Okay, rather than what is predetermined that that you should be. Um, so yeah, very. Um, very interesting topic. Um, I'm just uh, looking over here. Yeah, the, the other thing was, because we mentioned snake bite, we mentioned death by drowning, or there's all kinds of, uh, in this, this article, in the Serbian article, they were talking about all these superstitions that are connected to wells and uh, whether or not, and, or why you should choose a woman to marry who is from somewhere far away across water. Um, but yeah, there, there's all this, this kind of um, ideas that are, are connected to that. But also to wolves and wolf attacks, which are which are interesting. And <clears throat> what was pointed out was that the god Hades actually wears a, a wolf skin cloak, and uh, they were saying the Etruscan death god uh, has wolves ears. Okay, and uh, then we also have uh, Fenrir, which is the Catonic wolf figure that we see who is is capable of a lot of destruction in Norse mythology as well. Um, although the wolf does not necessarily have to have a, a feminine uh, connection, a lot of the other ideas are feminine in their in their inflection. So um, yeah, just just interesting um, thinking about about death and the ways in which one avoids death, um, and the way that that fate tends to operate as this this force this. It, it, it's definitely some kind of an ancestral kind of a force in the way that it operates and in the way that as, as, so much, as, as much of our life ends up being sort of predetermined seems to be connected to what's going on in our DNA, what's going on in our family lines. I mean, I've said, I was talking to um, somebody recently about, we have these arguments about health and nutrition, which is not something I'm that... Um, I'm not one of those people. <clears throat> it's funny. I I, mean, I do a lot of what people, some people consider holistic practices, but I, I don't eat organic food. I don't, um, you know, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not. I'm not huge on nutrition. I don't eat vegetable at all, or I eat very few. Always have, and actually, weirdly, that's also something from my family. A lot of us don't, especially on my um, 
father's side. My father always did, but the women in the family never do. And so I was having some kind of discussion about nutrition. And, you know, one of the things that came up was the the fact that you sometimes you'll have people who are like what my age is now, like I'm going to be um, 52 this month. And it was, and, and people around that age sometimes, uh, and I've noticed this a lot with people who, especially people who are very, very health conscious, you know, they, they watch everything that they eat. They only eat, you know, organic and pure foods. They, they, they jog every day. They, they do all these things. And then all of a sudden they just drop dead. They have a heart attack and they're gone just like that. And, uh, and so, yeah. And, and, but yet you'll have people who live the worst lifestyle possible, uh, eat the worst foods, you know, maybe drink a lot, smoke a lot, do things like that. And, you know, they live to be like a hundred years old and you're like, what? Yeah. You know, so you, you, you think, how many things have I denied myself over the years? And, you know, and now there's a, you know, and, and you die anyway, right? But that that's really, and to me, I've always felt that, uh, I mean, I realize a lot of that's anecdotal. Certainly there are scientific studies about what's good and what's not good. But to me, I feel that it, it says a lot about what is in your genes, what's in your genetics. Um, you can you can do things to improve your quality of life, but ultimately, when your when your genes are programmed for you to go out, you're gonna go out. I mean, people people do obviously die other ways. People have accidents, and um, you know, there's other kinds of tragic kinds of deaths. People can be murdered. You know, there's there's other tragic kinds of death that don't have to do with it. But if we're talking about a death that's based on your health and your body eventually giving out. Um, a lot of these, a lot of this is in your genetic code. Like that's, that's where your fate is. You know, that's, that's where that, that occurs. And again, we do all kinds of things, um, to try to, you know, now there's all kinds of tests that one can do, uh, genome tests and things, or, or, you know, looking for certain traits to see if you are prone to, uh, certain, you know, certain types of cancer or, uh, certain conditions like diabetes and things like that. Um, you can do a lot of things to, and, and you can you can head it off to a certain degree, but you really, you can't necessarily avoid it. Uh, sometimes people go to extreme measures. So for instance, if they think, well, they're prone to breast cancer, they might have a uh, preemptive mastectomy or something like that. And I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's going to remain, it, it, it's interesting to say in the long run, <clears throat> whether that actually solves the problem or not. Uh, maybe in some cases you can you can beat certain things, but ultimately um, my my uh, my happy note as I'm getting towards the end of this podcast is death comes to everybody. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, it's 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 just one of those things that's going to happen, and and it's and, you know and we also see these people um, like like okay like Bezos and some of these others who are I I think he's the one who's been looking into a way to try to achieve immortality, like, like, you know, dedicating the science to, to immortality. And that's, um, that's actually kind of ridiculous. I mean, my, my thing is, why do you want to live forever? Why would you want to do that? Um, if you're not, if you're not a deity, <laughs> you know, which, um, if you think about the life that you have now, even if it's not a bad life, even if it's good, it's like, why would you want to be here forever and ever and ever? I mean, the, the, as people get older, they get more and more disenfran you know, disenchanted with what comes before. They they don't they don't like change. You know, well, those kids these days and what they're doing. And, you know, everybody has something to say. We all have. A, when I was growing when I was growing up, you know, we walked uphill both ways and ten feet of snow with no shoes on. Yeah, you know, we all have our our thing about why we're somehow um, better. It's a uh, and she's saying <laughs> she's a, yeah that that is so cliche for an uber rich person, isn't it? Um, yeah, the idea that yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna achieve an immortality serum. It's like right, wait, so you can be a, a billionaire forever and like wait till somebody overthrows you. Yeah, that, that's that's it's <laughs> great. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's just I don't understand why. Any, I mean, again, I, I'm somebody who likes my life and enjoy, enjoys my life. I don't want to live forever. What for? Um, we all get to a point where we're very dissatisfied with the, what the world has changed into. Um, you know, some people can go with the flow and adapt. A lot of people are not that adaptable and they want to go back to the good old days of whatever. Of course, good old days is another mythology, but they want to, they want, they have a vision of a world, probably a vision of, of a world that never did exist to begin with. But now they, 
don't, um, but they, but, but they do you have this vision of, you know, what it was like. Like people will say, oh, if we only went back to the 50s or 60s. Look, even somebody who was born in the 70s and I go back and I, I think about my childhood and I think about pleasant aspects of my childhood or maybe my thoughts or my imagination or whatever and thinking, wow, you know, it wouldn't be cool. I mean, there's a lot of things about the 70s I still like. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I wear, I wear flare bottoms all the time. I love them. Uh, I have I have just certain things that um, I have nostalgia for the music of the 70s. I can't stand, I can stand almost nothing that's been recorded since the 2000s. Um, because there's, there's differences in the way uh, things have been recorded and so forth. And so I don't, I don't care for that. But, but nonetheless, if I think about the seventies, the aspects of it that I would not have known because I was a child, like the whole things that were going on with women's rights and the fact that I think before 1974, like a woman had to have her husband's permission to have a credit card. I mean, I mean, yeah, we do have a faction that's trying to move us back in that direction again, but putting that aside for the moment, there's, you, you think about it and you're like, yeah, you know what? Um, and you think that that would have been the thing. Like when I was a grown up, it would have been like, okay, well now you, now you got to go find yourself a husband. Like that, that would have been kind of a thing that would have been expected. It's not, not that it necessarily has to happen, but there was a cultural norm there that I think we'll look back on it and I go, wow. Yeah. Um, no, I guess I were, I'm glad that we're not back there. So we have these fantasy ideas about how things were and how great things used to be. Um, which is made mainly based on our personal past memories that might be pleasant uh, for us. But ultimately, um, th there's changes going on all the time. You know, things, things change all the time, and there's going to be aspects of change that we like and aspects that we don't. And uh, so, when, so when it comes to our, to our fate, to me, I'm thinking, okay, uh, how, how many changes do you want to live through? And um, how well do you weather change? Um, but, but to me, acceptance of life, acceptance of death is really the same as acceptance of life. Um, I, <clears throat> I find that uh, an acceptance of, of death and an, an embracing of the fact that this is, this is a reality of life, not, not an unpleasant one, but just, just one that's there, uh, makes, makes, actually makes my life a lot more pleasant. Um, not, not because you're looking, you're wishing for anybody, anything to happen to anybody. It's not about the death aspect itself, just about the fact that things can change and do change. You wouldn't want things to be the same all the time. You just wouldn't, yeah, you know, same thing over and over again. Uh, that's going to drive you crazy too. You, you need, there needs to be movement. If, if you feel like nothing ever moves forward, uh, that's an issue as well. Uh, so, and as I said, I think I said it, um, probably in the beginning of my, my academic book, the, the, way that a, the way that a culture responds to death uh, tells you a lot about the culture. And I think we live in a culture that spends a lot of time trying to avoid death. Between all of this genetic modification, between the things that we do to try to continually make yourself, ourselves look younger, like me with my, my fabulous red hair here when it's probably dead white, um, you know, we all, we all have things that we do to try to, uh, to stave off the inevitable, I guess. But um, and, and then of course, when people are actually on their deathbed, the way that we manage that as well, that's that, that again is another entirely separate subject. But, um, in any case, it, I think that there's the, the, the most interesting thing out of the fate discussion for me is the fact that you can't, you can't reason your way out of it. You can try to take certain preparations. Um, you can, you can try to eat a certain way. You can try to exercise that, but as as I'm just saying, you know, whatever's going to happen to you is going to happen to you. You could, you could be very physically fit and done everything right. And you could walk out, step out in the street, get hit by a bus. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen to you. And that's the thing. I mean, we can live in fear all the time, like, you know, walking around like, oh my God, you know, what's going to jump out at me from the next corner. Um, and, uh, so that would, yeah. So that allowed me, so what I'm going to end on is yet another Alan Watts thing. I kind of started with Alan Watts, stuck him in the middle somewhere. Uh, and, and putting him at the end here, when he talks about uh, Zen training and, and training as a Zen master, when they would, when someone would come into the monastery to be training, they would be assigned certain chores and tasks. And while they were doing those tasks, the master would appear out of nowhere and beat them with a stick. And they had to fight the master off with whatever they had available. And so what ends up happening is that the person gets up and they're very on edge all the time. They're like, okay, where's he going to come from now? And no matter what they do, the master always manages to sneak up on them and get, you know, get a good one in on them. Um, and finally, after a while, the student says, okay, 
what's the point? I mean, why, why am I doing this? And then once they yield to the fact that this, this surprise, these, these, these things that, that kind of come at us out of nowhere, it's, it's just going to happen. It's just how it is. Once they have an acceptance of that, then their training actually begins because that's the point at which you recognize that you just go with the flow of what's going on. You don't spend all your time fighting to try to be doing something different. And that when we talk about our fate, it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not so much that we should you know, not be proactive in our lives or not do certain things, but what we spend a lot of time, anxiety and energy trying to fight things that just are, <laughs> that just are. And so I think when we see mythologies about the fates, it's, and, and, and all these people trying to like, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to get around this. The more you try to figure out a way around it, the more you just walk right into it. Um, it you're, it, it's, it's one of those areas where our, our reason um, has limited applicability, let's call it that. Uh, and, and, and to me, it's, it's a recognition. And I think it's very fitting that the role of fates are played by catonic women who are kind of reminding you that no, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you walk around like, Hey, I'm so smart, you know? Um, and yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe we're, we're smart in some ways. That's, that's good. But, um, but ultimately when it comes to those kinds of ultimate questions, when it comes to, to one's fate, to where one's going to end up, um, that's, that's where you really have to take the more feminine role. You have to take the more passive role and say, it's going to be what it's going to be. And I might as well be happy and enjoy my life and be here now instead of continually worrying about um, what's going to happen tomorrow. So anyway, that's it for me t uh, today. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. And we'll see what topic I come up with next week. Um, I wish you all a, a very safe and um, as uh, <laughs> delay-free possible uh, Mercury retrograde because <laughs> uh, it starts today and ends on April 24th. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the live stream, I've already had two things today already. I was just like, okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this, this goes. But, um, anyway, I hope you all have a, a good April. And of course I will be back next week. Next week, I think is actually the solar eclipse. So that's going to be interesting because the eclipse is going to be happening at the time that I'm doing this next week. Um, so yeah, that'll be, uh, we'll, we'll see how, uh, how that goes. All right. Everybody have a great week and we'll see you next time.